Well, I'd first like to take a moment to thank everyone here at St. John the Divine for welcoming me this summer. My name is Caroline. I am one of your summer seminarians, along with Ellen Kelly, who I think is at the other service right now. Um, I am a seminarian from the Diocese of Southwest Florida, and I attend the Episcopal Theological Seminary of the Southwest just down the road in Austin, Texas. And I really do just want to emphasize again how grateful I am to have spent the summer here with you all. It's crazy that it's been, I think, nine weeks now, which is so wild. Time flies when you're having fun, right? Um, the other day, I was talking to Dr. Kira Molman Pettit, who uh, I think was in here preaching last week. But she asked um, Ellen and myself, what was the one main takeaway that we would kind of take with us uh, leaving this summer. And I told her that I think I came into this experience this summer thinking that my main takeaway would be something sort of practical and logistical in nature, you know, working at a large and growing Episcopal parish and learning about the different systems in place that um, sort of approaching pastoral care and evangelism and liturgy. And while I've learned so much about all of those things, really my main takeaway has been much more spiritual in nature. Um, you all are on fire for the gospel. It's amazing. Um, you're so invested in your personal relationship with Jesus and that love that comes from that has just been so contagious. And um, that has been such a blessing and a grace for me. I have experienced that through your hospitality and your kindness. Um, so I really, I just wanna say thank you again um, and thank you for helping me grow closer to Jesus. Uh, I was born and raised in a little beach town called Sarasota on the Gulf Coast of Florida. And I lived there until I left for college. I lived there with my parents, my mom and my dad, and my three older siblings. My brothers are 14 months to the day older than I am, so we kept our parents very busy, as you can imagine. Uh, and my older sister, who's about seven years older than I am. And my siblings and I were talking the other day, um, and the topic of conversation were the many different terms and phrases that my dad often uses. Um, we lovingly call them Steve-isms. Uh, my dad's name is Steve, so that's where that comes from. Uh, and there are many Steve-isms that we love. Some are more church appropriate than others, um, <laughs> as you can imagine for the parents in the room, but my siblings and I narrowed it down to our top three Steve-isms uh, in no particular order. Number one, every day before we left the house to go to school or even now if we're home and we're leaving for the day, my dad will kiss us on the forehead and say, have a great day and do good things. That's sweet, right? That's real nice. Highly recommend taking that home with you today. Uh, the second one is a little bit sillier in nature. Um, sometimes my dad comes up with his own words, uh, as we all do from time to time, but um, it, rather than saying yes or indeed or absolutely, my dad will often say, indeedy doodle, um, which is just indeed, but with a little more pizzazz. You can take that one home with you too, if you'd like. And then the third one that we were talking about um, usually happens at dinner time. My family, uh, we're very lucky. My mom is a fantastic cook. And so often we were able to have family dinners most weeknights when I was growing up. And my brothers growing boys, right? My mom always made some extra. And so at the end of the meal, when we were thanking my mom, uh, she would always ask, you know, is that, did everyone have enough? There might be more in the kitchen if you need. Um, and every time without fail, if my dad is full, he will lean back in his chair, pat on his stomach a couple times, and say, mm, I am satisfied. <laughs> I am satisfied. And this phrase has been playing over and over in my head all week because the messaging to us in our world and culture today is so often the opposite, right? And I will confess my background is in marketing and communication, so I have been the one who has helped perpetuate this narrative from time to time. Scarcity marketing is a tool that's often used to boost sales quickly. You've heard it before, for just three easy payments of $19.99, you too can be as happy and successful as the model in this ad campaign. But if you don't lock in this deal by midnight, 
you'll continue to live a life of mediocrity. <laughs> if you join our gym and follow this routine for just 30 days, you'll be as shredded as the bodybuilder in this commercial. But spots are limited. This surely will be the key to your ultimate freedom, fulfillment, and success. Scarcity marketing works because it banks on the fact that each of us, in the words of the Rolling Stones, can't get no satisfaction. There we go, thanks y'all. <laughs> it banks on the fact that we are all hungry for something, searching for something better, something more. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus looks up and sees a large crowd coming toward him, and he asks Philip a question. Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? But Philip, in his concern for the situation at hand, replied to a different question entirely. 200 denarii, six months' wages at the time, would not be enough for each of them to get a little. And yet, in our collect today, we pray, with you as our ruler and guide, may we pass through things temporal so that we do not lose things eternal. What is it about our temporal lives here on earth that make us crave more power and yet live in fear of scarcity, of not having enough? Everyone hungers for something. Maybe for you that something is a bigger budget, a new car, a better job, more control. The Bible teaches that we all hunger for God, even if we don't recognize it. Augustine said it well in Confessions, you have made for yourself, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. But we all have desires beyond our relationship with God as well. And on the surface, many of these things don't seem inherently bad, like wanting a more peaceful world, or that a sick loved one is healed. The problem enters when we perpetuate a cycle that is quite literally a tale as old as time, the original sin, when our hunger for God is replaced by the belief that somehow I myself can find ultimate satisfaction to my deepest longings through my own actions and pursuits in this life. And this is where we find King David today. Today we see the destruction that comes from disordered hunger. David has put himself in this position. There's no one around him to hold him accountable. His wealth and power and standing have not satisfied him. He craves something more. And as the old saying goes, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. He's looking for love in all the wrong places. Even this great king, the king who has been devoted to Yahweh, resigns to being just like any other king. He uses his power, sees Bathsheba, and takes her. This is not some sort of consensual affair. This is an abuse, an abuse of power and an abuse of another child of God. And rather than turning to God in repentance, David tries to cover it up his own fear of getting caught, his desire to keep his power and maintain his status, gets in the way of turning immediately to God, his ever-present help in trouble. And we see the domino effect of this sin, more lies, more deception, and ultimately murder. And while I'd love to say that humanity has moved far away from these things, if you are even the least bit privy to the happenings of our world today, we know that that is certainly not the case. While power seeks more of itself, the rest of our lives often seem governed by scarcity. There never seems to be enough, enough money, enough time, enough care or attention, enough food for the hungry enough jobs for those seeking work. 
When these pressures of power and scarcity govern us, we often try to white knuckle our circumstances, take control ourselves. We set our course and sail on until the sea becomes rough and the winds toss us. Then in our fear, we row as hard as we can against the storms and only then in our panic do we finally cry out, where are you, God? The good news today is that God continues to work as God has always done. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, God works through each of us, flaws and all, in ways beyond our wildest imaginations. Through David and Bathsheba came Solomon, and a thousand years later, through this same lineage, there was a baby born in Bethlehem with no earthly power to his name, but overflowing with divine love, abundant enough to redeem the world. In today's gospel, that same incarnate God in Jesus sees the world's hunger and knows exactly how he will feed and satisfy the multitudes. This, the feeding of the 5,000, is the only miracle recorded in all four gospel accounts. And the details are all remarkably similar. The emphasis is always on the feeding from these five barley loaves, poor men's food, and two fish, probably more similar to sardines. There aren't specifics given about the many healings we're told Jesus does. We're not given the details or the ins and outs of his teachings, but in every single account, the people are satisfied and there are baskets of bread left over. The emphasis is always on the abundance from what seems like so little that the kingdom of God has to offer. And later when Jesus hears and sees his friends' fears on the stormy sea, when all hope was lost, he draws near to them and reassures them, it is I, do not be afraid. And this is true for us still today. The feeding of the 5,000 is a preview of the Holy Eucharist. What we see is abundance from what seems like not enough. Yet each person who partook in the feast was satisfied and there was plenty left over. Our God is a God of abundance. He was then and he certainly still is today. For someone on the outside looking in, the idea of a small wafer and a sip of wine being the most substantial and satisfying meal any one of us could partake in is absolutely absurd. But we know that what we are receiving is not simply bread and wine, but the body and blood of our Lord. We are receiving life and love itself. Our Lord is drawing near to each of us, his true presence in the elements, because he loves us that much. The bread we receive, some call it a wafer, is traditionally called a host. The word host comes from the Latin word hostia, which means sacrificial victim. Victim. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, submitted himself to suffering and to death to lift us out of the cycle David found himself in today, the cycle of power-hungry self-sufficiency, so that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. Because he is life abundant, so abundant, that even death could not defeat him. The same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is present in the elements on our altars of our church today. At the Eucharist, you and I, we go to Calvary. We are at the foot of the cross where heaven and earth meet, where we behold him, lay down our burdens and desires and receive him who obtains salvation for us. 
Here's the secret. You ready? The secret to having a genuinely satisfying life lies beneath that cross at Calvary. It is here when we finally and once for all accept that the gospel, the ministry and work of Jesus Christ is where we find life and find it more abundantly. Where we too can sit back and say, I am satisfied because all things have been done in Christ, who is the life of the world. Amen.